Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a CastBox original produced in partnership with our friends at Studio 71. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and all of your favorite podcasts are there, ripe for the downloading. Sacred Symbols is available wherever you get your podcasts, of course, but we hope you'll give CastBox a shot. We think it's pretty rad. To get each episode of Sacred Symbols three days before the public, completely ad-free, please consider supporting the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Perks for support include not only getting the show early and ad-free, but you can also gain access to monthly exclusive podcasts, and supporting on Patreon is the only way to get your listener mail read on the air, and much more. Plus, supporting Sacred Symbols on Patreon also nets you perks for other Collins Last Stand shows automatically, including the Nostalgia and Retro Podcast Knockback, the YouTube series dedicated to gaming called SideQuest, and the eclectic interview podcast Fireside Chats. Thank you for your generosity, kindness, and support. Without you, Sacred Symbols and all things Collins Last Stand would not exist. But enough of that. On to the show. Greetings and and salutations, everybody. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. I'm your co-host, Chris Raygun, and I'm joined once again by the uh, gallivanting uh, Colin Moriarty. How's it going? It's going well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing good. You want to just lead the show? I mean, this is perfectly fine. Is this because I stole your outro last week? Yes, it is. This seems inordinate because also on our Bloodborne Let's Play, which some people weren't very pleased about, by the way. I know. (laughs) But on our Bloodborne Let's Play... You had already I taken did it, but, but I realized that I didn't do it on the actual show proper. And I, I was see. like, oh, I should probably do it on the show proper. Seems like an unnecessary escalation, but no. I appreciate that. Welcome to Sacred Symbols, our PlayStation podcast. This is episode 41. We appreciate all of you joining us as about 50,000 of you do for each episode. And we thank you very much for your kindness, generosity and support. Whether you listen to us on free feeds or hopefully support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand, where you can get every episode of this show three days early and without ads. We are making Tuesdays great again. Yes, we are. Now, we were talking, Chris, I have a bunch of notes here to get into before we actually get into the show itself. And one of the notes, ironically, was about that Let's Play. Yeah. For people that don't know, we have a little vote on Patreon. Thousands of you over there that vote in these various elections that we do. And you selected for us to do a Bloodborne Let's Play. And I delivered what I thought, or we delivered what, I mean, I can't speak for Chris. I can let him speak for himself. But I delivered what I thought was what you would expect (laughs) <laughs> out of a Bloodborne Let's Play. Just making the character? Yeah, for this show. Because yeah. I feel like, listen, it's something that I said on Patreon to someone. I feel like the audience has to know us better than this to think that they're going to get a serious just Bloodborne Let's Play out of out of me or you. But beyond that, I don't want to act like our assessment of the situation is necessarily valid. Maybe that's what some people want. Hmm. But after doing a YouTuber Life Let's Play and then a Scrabble <laughs> Let's Play... <laughs> I would assume that you kind of knew the trajectory we were on, and I'm a little nervous about the Kingdom Hearts 3 Let's Play, which we're going to do in the next few weeks, because I'm not playing Kingdom Hearts 3. I mean, I, 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 my intention was to just make fun of it. <laughs> no, I think uh, ultimately it boils down to maybe cutting them down a little bit, maybe getting the silences out, maybe cutting it down to the juicy parts. Maybe sure. that'll work. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I'll do it. Oh, if you want I like to editing it. Let's Plays a lot, actually. Cool. I mean, I watched actually the Let's Play and I did cut out a little bit of it, but I don't know. I thought it was funny. And, and you know, to be fair, it has like a six to one like to dislike ratio on YouTube, which is pretty good. Yeah, but yeah, usually we get much better than that. So I just wanted to throw it out there that we thought you would enjoy Kremit and watching <laughs> us create Kremit the world's saddest hunter. They want to see hunter. more of Kremit. That's what they're saying. Kremit saved and we can go and fight the cleric beast or whatever the first boss is if you want. But again, this is a game like we were talking about even with Sekiro recently. You can't just pick it up and play it. Someone was making fun of me like he's not even locking on. It's like, dude, I haven't played Bloodborne in like two years. I don't know what the fuck's going on in this game. Anymore. Yeah, it's been a while since like, I've played Bloodborne. I've literally too. played probably 150 games since I've played Bloodborne. You know, like, what do you want from me? <laughs> you think I'm going to remember I like had a lock on immediately? Anyway, I wanted to throw that out there that we do hear some of you. It is a minority of people, but I want to be zany and silly and stupid and irreverent. That's kind of what I want to do with our Let's Plays. And if I want to do a serious Let's Play, I'll sit down and do one. Like, I've done that, too. Right. But for the both of us, I don't feel like that that's really the style. We'll figure it out. I think Kingdom Hearts is going to be a lot of fun. I've been doing a lot of research. Yeah. I'm a lore master now. Great. <laughs> At least someone knows what the hell is going on here. Oh, I still don't know, but I mean, hey, I'm trying. Yeah, well, I appreciate your effort because I'm not putting any effort into learning anything about Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> cool. So we're going to go in blind, or I'm going in blind anyway. 
Chris, next week's episode, episode 42, is going to be recorded and published for patrons a day later than usual. It's going to be recorded on a Tuesday and published on a Wednesday instead of recorded on a Monday and published on a Tuesday. This is to accommodate my brother Dagan coming to Santa Monica in the next few days to record a bunch of episodes of our nostalgia and retro podcast, Knockback. He's leaving Monday night, so we're simply not going to have any time to record that day and at least edit the show. So we're going to record and we've been late in the past, but I like to let people know we're going to record just the next day. So on Patreon, you're only going to get it for 48 hours instead of 72 just for that one week. Shouldn't affect free feeds at all. Appreciate your patience. Otherwise, we would have had a very rushed show. Want to make sure that our minds are present and we're able to do the best possible show for those out there that enjoy it and look forward to it. So thank you for your understanding. Chris, as you know, Mm -hmm. people on Patreon can write into us with their questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas. That's how you interact with our show by supporting us on Patreon. Brandon Hardman wrote into us. Okay. He asked, is farting at the urinal socially acceptable? If you have to ask, then the answer is no, Hmm. is typically my my response to anything that's even remotely like this. That's interesting. So your answer then is no, it's not socially acceptable. No. Oh, I totally disagree. (laughs) What? Flagrantly disagree. No, don't. Now, there's some weird things that I've noticed about the urinal in my 34 years on this planet and what people do with them and what people place in them. You're often going to find people's boogers in a urinal. You've never seen people's boogers in a urinal? I've never stared into the... You don't look the at the ab- urinal. No, I don't look at the you urinal. You look straight ahead. I don't c- care. I don't care what's going on. This is not my property. How do you feel about the little urinals where there's a fly, like, basted into the... Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, a fly icon basted into, like, the ceramic and you aim at it. That's, like, the perfect place to aim. You know what I'm talking about? I think so. Uh, you don't know anything about urinals. I this don't. Really I don't just, use public bathrooms. What do you do? I just don't. You hold it? Yeah. Oh. I either hold it or I go home. You're like a little camel, aren't you? I don't trust public spaces in general. Yeah. I let don't, alone bathrooms. I don't trust them, but sometimes you have to utilize them. Nonetheless. Sometimes you have to go. I'll, I'll use the stall. Really? So you I do don't use, the use you? Wow. I use the stall because I hate, I so hate, you, I just you, hate the public thing. We had to work around this. So you were embarrassed to admit that you don't even use the urinal. You have no familiarity with the urinal. No, I, the, I don't. How about the trough? The trough. Yeah, you ever go to like a sporting event? Oh, you don't really go to no, sporting events. No, I don't event. go to sporting events. But event. if you've ever been to an arena or something like that, often they have a trough. Instead of like individual urinals, it's literally just like a... Maybe when I was like a kid. Like I went to Yankee Stadium maybe twice when I was a kid. Yeah, I think they have them at the old Yankee Stadium. Yeah, maybe. I haven't been to the new Yankee Stadium. I think farting at the urinal is perfectly acceptable. I've ripped ass at urinals more times than I can count, you know? And I've... I've you know, if you don't hear it, you can feel We're, other people doing what they need to do. We are mere steps away from falling back to the ways of the animal. Yeah, perhaps so. Does the lion fart at the urinal? I don't know. No, it doesn't use the urinal like a proper mammal. That's true. He, he just pees wherever he wants to pee. Or like I, would ex- I accept peeing outside anywhere else than at a urinal. Really? Yeah. I don't give a damn. Pee on a Corolla passing by. Does nothing for me. You got some beef with Toyotas? No, I actually like Corollas a lot. Oh. Camrys, on the other hand. Camrys. Gross. Camrys. Disgusting. I couldn't even know if I, I don't know if I could pick. If you put a Toyota Camry and a Toyota Corolla in front of me and we're like, which one is the Camry and which one is the Corolla? I'm like, I don't. I'm definitely Corolla it's a, master. It's a, it's a coin flip. <laughs> now, uh, Chris, Zach O'Brien wrote into us and said, I relapsed and started collecting absurdly easy platinums on my Vita while at work again. I'm ashamed to look at my trophy list and see little adventures on the prairie at the top. I have an impressive <laughs> list of platinums, but my list will forever be tainted. All for the rush of seeing a platinum pop. I'm sorry, Colin. Zach, this is an embarrassment, and it seems like someone needs to step in. There's all of these easy platinum games that are coming out that I'm avoiding by design, even if some of the games look good, because yeah. I don't want them on my list. That's I will fair. not have them in my list. I'm not one of these people that play the I Am Mayo game and the, all of these other games. You oh, get, I Am Bread. Yeah, whatever it is. Like you get yeah. I think the Mayo game. I think it literally took like 15 minutes to get a platinum trophy. That's not acceptable. And you're you know what, Zach, I hate to tell you this. You're part of the problem. I would have loved it if that submission just ended at I relapsed. <laughs> that, was, that was just all I said. I rel- <laughs> and now he's gone. <laughs> I relapsed. Colin. Bye. We do have a couple of corrections that okay. I feel like are essential for us to read. One of them. Rather aggressive, I might add. Ooh. Blake Gevinen wrote into us and said, Cuckoo Colin and Complicit Chris, gentlemen, I write to you after listening for not one but two weeks of discussion dismissing the idea that there are developers other than FromSoft that make approximately the same game for multiple publishers. During this discussion, you have both neglected to mention the gifted developer Platinum Games, who have made Nier Automata, published by Square Enix, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, published by Konami, Bayonetta 1 and 2, published by Sega and Nintendo, respectively, Transformers Devastation, published by Activision, and many others. All of these games are the same general flavor of action game, and I just wanted to write in to make you aware that there are other prominent examples of successful developers who work with many different publishers to develop multiple games in the same style. Keep up the work, gentlemen. I'd say it was good. 
but you just got schooled. <laughs> That's pretty good. Holy I moly. Like that. that is true. I did, I did kind of forget about platinum. I accept this answer. I'm going to allow this. I am going to allow it, but I don't know that this is incredibly in the spirit to the point of from software. Like I mentioned, Omega Force is really a great example, although they only work for it. They're owned by Tecmo Koei. Yeah. So Blake, point taken. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I think it's we also kind of mentioned Bungie, who's been making shooters forever. Peter J also wrote into us with a correction. Actually, this is more of a clarification. Peter J says, greeting CNC Sexy Factory. Just wanted to acknowledge that YouTuber you mentioned last week. His name is Ryan Benecki and his YouTube channel is called Mystic. He's a kindred spirit who deals mostly with PlayStation news and he's also does the occasional documentary and he's a huge Vita fan. So this is the guy we mentioned last week. For those that don't remember, I mentioned a video where a guy went into all of these random old Vita games and found lobbies. And this was really right, interesting right. because of the Drive Club closure where he's like, I can still find people playing literally Resistance Retribution. Actually, Burning Skies is the Vita one. Retribution is the PSP one. So I wanted to give a shout out, Mystic the YouTuber, where you liked your video or I liked your video. Chris has no idea what's going on. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know any of this. Finally, I wanted to bring this up before we get into the news. This is very newsworthy, but I didn't know yeah. quite how to approach it. So we'll see what happens. I it's, just wanted to bring this up. It's super interesting. Victor A. Ramos wrote into us, said, hello, courageous Colin and corn fed Chris. Are you a fan of corn, Chris? I love No, corn. not really. Oh, you're not, not a corn guy. You wouldn't be welcome on Long Island. <laughs> More information on Anthem's disaster of a development cycle has come up recently via, via Jason Schreier's Kotaku article. Bioware's response to the expose was not the best. What is your take on this issue? I don't understand how they managed to mess things up this badly. More importantly, do you think we will ever see a return to form for the once critically acclaimed studio? Keep this wonderful thing going. Proud to be a patron. Thank you, Victor. So I want to set the stage before I kick it to you, Chris. Yeah. Jason Schreier, who's easily the, the best working journalist in the industry and really one of the only journalists in the industry, actually, that writes anything of consequence, wrote this really amazing expose on Kotaku, as he often does. This one about the culture at Bioware and Edmonton and also in Austin, Texas, and the creation of Anthem and how tortured it was and how the game was really created in like two years. It was basically in pre-production forever. And its pre-production time was probably two and a half or three times longer than its actual dev time. Yeah. And he spoke to anonymous people and some people on the record, I think, about the culture at Bioware, what's going on with EA, the frustrations with DICE's Frostbite engine. Uh, you know, not looking at their competition very wisely with Destiny and, and the Division, etc. I thought it was a very interesting article. I read it in bed one day. It's incredibly long. I think it's too long. And I actually like verbose stuff. And I'm like, you can probably. I disagreed entirely. I thought okay, I, yeah, I read please. through it immediately. And I, I read through like the entire thing in one sitting. It was so interesting. <laughs> Yeah. It's so so what cool. did you? So what did you think? It's kind of baffling. I, I the, part of the question there is like, will there be a return to form for Bioware? I'm I'm sure there probably can be. I don't like to write studios off because they make bad calls sometimes. I think. Uh, I mean, famously, Santa Monica put out God of War Ascension, right? Yeah, and, and, that they, and they even more famously canceled the game like three years. Into yeah, yeah, that and, and then them. they came out with probably one of the best single player games of the last 20 years, probably, in my opinion. And, you know, there's always a chance for like reinventing yourself. But I think it's fascinating just that the culture in Bioware is kind of the same as the culture that's looking into it. The idea that there is an A team and a B team and a C team and then it's viewed that way from the in, the internal side is super fascinating. There are, there used to be three Biowares, right? The home Biowares in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, way up there in the snowy north. And then they have a B team in Austin, Texas. These are the guys that originally did the Star Wars Old Republic MMO that came out in like, what, 2011 or 2012. And I've been kind of managing that. And then there was a team in Montreal that was a Bioware team that has actually folded. And they're the ones that did Mass Effect Andromeda. They were considered the C team. Mm -hmm. So, yes, to Chris's point and what it says in the article is that internally and even with like, you know, other subsidiaries and at EA, Edmonton was really looked at as the talent. Edmonton treated the others apparently as if they weren't the town and were kind of like just there to do what they said. It's kind of interesting because they, they talk, uh, he talks a little bit uh, in the article about how they refused to, to talk about Destiny or even look at any of the other market leaders in the field of, uh, or in the genre that they were delving into. And it kind of resonated with me because when I was playing Anthem, I was thinking, wow, this feels like nothing was learned. I felt like it was late to the party because it was just making all the same mistakes that vanilla Destiny made back in 2014. And I'm like, how did they do that? And I guess that's the answer. They weren't allowed to talk about it. <laughs> right, exactly. And what's interesting per that point, Chris, that you bring up is that one of the people he speaks to says that they didn't know how to make this kind of game. Like they actually needed to study these other games in order to understand how you make a loot system and how you get people seamlessly it's, in and out. It's just smart to look right. at the competition in general. Like ignoring the competition is insanely fatal. Like, I don't know how, why you would do that. 
it's I don't such either. a bad strategy in pretty much any walk of life, you know? Definitely. I mean, you have to kind of grab the bull by the horns and figure things out. And with loot from the very limited games that I play that have this loot system, they all seem to kind of borrow from each other. The people at Bioware are basically admitting, like, we just don't know how to make the game that we're being asked to make. Like, we don't make this kind of game. We, we don't know well, how they, to do they, it. Well, they weren't even asked to make it. They wanted to make something, and then it evolved eventually into a looter shooter. They didn't set out to make it. EA didn't force them to do it. EA didn't even make them use Frostbite, even though Bioware hates using Frostbite, which is kind of weird to me. Yeah, Frostbite, the engine, which it comes from DICE. Yeah. Fantastic it, FPS engine. Yeah, it's a good engine. And, and people have to understand that the reason that developers and publishers are getting so crazy about keeping an engines internal is because you pay so much money either up front or usually on the back end for using other engines. We discussed it with Days Gone. You have to assume Epic and Sony maybe come up came up with a different deal. But typically speaking, if you use Unreal Engine in your game, you owe 5% of gross revenues to Epic forever on that game. So it's a serious thing. So instead of looking and shopping, they have Frostbite, just like Sony internally has Decima, et cetera, and so on, like these engines where they just control them. But when you're using an engine and you're using all the system and tools, if you guys look at it and you research it, it's all about like kind of chronicling what works and what doesn't. And things are really broken. Like there's a wiki that comes with a lot of engines, like an internal wiki where it tells you how to do things and it's all patched together and it's all fucked up. And the team you need to work with is on the other side of the world. And it doesn't, by the way, you're making like a third person multiplayer game. They make first person games. They don't know, yeah. like it's not even really supposed to be able to do this. They were saying something interesting in there where like there were not even, I think with the last Dragon Age game was on Frostbite and they were saying that there was not even like an inventory system or the ability to like save Yeah, yeah. in the engine. Yeah, because you didn't, you, right. FPSs or specifically Battlefield games, which is particularly what Frostbite's used for, there's no saving in a multiplayer. Right, <laughs> exactly. Match. So the point is, is that they had to like make all these tools. It was very complicated. Yeah. But an interesting story nonetheless, and uh, I don't know, Chris, if you have any opinion on this, but I really feel like EA had allowed Bioware to do irreparable damage to it. I, I don't know that Bioware will really ever recover from Anthem. And what I mean by that is it's kind of similar to Bethesda Game Studios, where I, I think you're kind of crazy if you're excited about Starfield or The Elder Scrolls 6 in the same way you might have been excited about Fallout 4 after what they've showed you. I mean... Sure. You know, and, and it's the same thing with Bioware now where it's like, first of all, I called this a mile away. I must say, I said Anthem was fucked a long time ago. It was obvious <laughs> the way they were talking about it. So did know? I. And so I'm not super surprised about it. I also want to throw in that I know a lot of people are enjoying it. But I want to say that this article is a must read and you really should go yeah. check it out. I don't know that we have too much. Well, I don't want to speak for Chris. Do you have anything else you'd like to say about it? I just read it. It's really cool. Their name was decided like a week before the E3 conference and that all that entire gameplay demo just wasn't real at all. It's an interesting story. I recommend reading it like entirely. Yeah. And I think that the name Anthem initially like didn't mean anything. Yeah. They actually had a right like retroactively right lore that made that yeah. name even sense. It was make originally sense. called Beyond, but they couldn't secure the trademark or something. Right. Which is a really terrible name. First it, of all, Anthem's yeah. a way better name beyond's a terrible name there already is a game called beyond there's also a massively popular podcast called beyond and i don't know why you would ever want to mix that's like such a fucking stupid name when i see when i see names sometimes i'm like <laughs> i'm surprised what that doing? destiny ended up being called destiny i thought that was like the project like the internal like uh, natal kind of deal right. like a code name i was surprised that that ended up being the name yeah like, destiny's how do, how do you... a bad name too actually yeah. but it it worked out fine now chris let's get into what we're playing sure you can go first i see here that you have a couple of games to talk about yeah, so I'm playing uh, Borderlands Game of the Year Edition, which is uh, basically just a glorified re-release of the original Borderlands. It's the same. They, there's, they, they added a mini-map, and there's like some little quality of life changes, but it looks more or less exactly how I remember it looking. I think that's probably because the art style of that game is so ingrained in what it is. It doesn't really age. Even when it looks kind of rough around the edges, it still looks like Borderlands. That's the interesting thing about that cell shade kind of yeah, thing. If you, if you have it's it kind in, of evergreen. Yeah, if you have it in an HD resolution, it's kind of similar to Wind Waker. That game still looks really good, yeah. in my opinion. Like, I still look at that game and I'm like, this looks way better than actually like Skyward Sword or something like that. No, it, it does. I like it a little bit more than I thought I would. I remember playing the original Borderlands a lot with my friends in high school. I was never super into it, but I did have a lot of fun with it uh, back in the day. And I don't know, playing through it again is just uh, kind of interesting. It has this weird like primal thing where it just like it's really good at setting you off to do something and making you feel rewarded for doing that thing, even if it's like a really menial thing, like talk to this person. It really feels like the blueprint from like which 
Destiny and like all these other looter shooters really came from. It, it's kind of ahead of its time. Yeah, Borderlands came out in 2009 and I remember really clearly playing it because I had never at that time really played anything like it. And, and I don't beg the audience to believe that I know everything about every game that's ever come out. And, and there might be PC centric shooters that were kind of like this, but on console, it was definitely I'd really be hard console. pressed yet to think of something that was like Borderlands before yeah. Borderlands, you know? We had other games. That's why it's so surprising Rage 2 is coming out soon. We're going to talk about Rage 2 in a little while because yeah. Rage was really the only other game that I would ever compare to Borderlands back then. You know, they, yeah. it came out afterwards, but they were kind of comparable to each other, not graphically, but in their style. And then they both got sequels. One's getting a sequel that I think is going to round it out because I remember Borderlands feeling really small, actually, compared to Borderlands 2. It's like segmented. It's like a pseudo open world, right? Yeah, yeah. it's definitely more segmented. Yeah. Uh, it's more like arenas put together by like caves and hallways, which is actually basically what Destiny is also. But I like it. I think the atmosphere is a little bit more tame and more subtle than Borderlands 2 is with its kind of over the top kind of meme writing. I didn't, right. I didn't hate that. But it definitely feels like the first game opens with like Cage the Elephant and it feels like, oh, this is kind of this has its own kind of personality going on that isn't necessarily all derived from forums on the Internet. Right. You know what I mean, right. I'm excited to play it. It's on the list. I don't know what I'm going to get to it probably yeah. after Days Gone because there's just my brother's coming. There's other things to yeah. deal with. But the shooting is still awkward. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I know you have a bit cool. of a problem with it. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It does come with all the DLC as well. I think it's all just in there. Yeah, and I never played the DLC, so it'll, be, it'll be cool to check out. And, and then, I've also been playing yeah. this weird... So I saw this game at PAX, and they sent me a code uh, on Twitter yesterday by chance. It's called Dangerous Driving. It's basically just... It feels like a spiritual successor to Burnout. It's more of an indie game. But I, I remember seeing it at PAX like, oh, that looks like Burnout. I like that, but I couldn't stop to play it. So it's great that they sent me a code. It plays uh, pretty much exactly how you would expect a game that is inspired by Burnout to play. And it really just makes me miss Burnout quite a bit because it feels almost perfect. Almost. There's like some jankiness. It is an indie title, so there's obviously less uh, polish around it. But smashing cars into the side of a, ra uh, of a racetrack at like ridiculously high speeds is awesome, regardless of where it is or what game it's in. I, like I really the, miss Burnout. I like the name. It's a good name. See, we're talking about titles. That's a good name. So that's great that you got a code. And and uh, yeah, I see that that comes out this week. So Chris, I've been playing. Well, first of all, I've been playing still the Division 2 and God Wars. I want to talk a little bit about them, even though I've been kind of really spreading this out with these games. Just a couple new thoughts before I get into what I've been playing that's new. The Division 2 is really becoming this comfort food for me where I don't play it for a few days and then I just sit down and play it for a little while and I just really like it. Like, I just like that game a lot. I think it's probably my game of the year so far. Really? It's just, it's just really good. It just feels good. It runs well. It feels rewarding. I feel like I'm really, really slow burning it, which maybe a lot of people aren't, but I am. I'm level 27, so I'm almost at the level cap, but I have all the shit still to do. Yeah. The DLC now is going to start rolling in actually somewhat soon with updates and also the the big robust mm -hmm. updates that they're doing. And so I don't know, man, I, I really like the division. They really nailed the feeling of actually progressing. What I like about it is that it really straddles that line between incoherent and coherent with like how much is going on in <laughs> yeah. the game. But it doesn't go over into the incoherent camp. There are games where I play for hours, sometimes tens or scores. hours. I'm like, I still don't know what that even means, like what that does. A good example, actually, is I think I beat all of I Am Setsuna, the JRPG, without knowing something about like this counterattack move or something that I never did, you know, and this particular game has like, you know, your upgrades and you're leveling up and you're leveling up in the dark zone and you're finding gear and you're upgrading your little settle settlements and all this kind of stuff. And it never really feels too much. The only thing that I say, I will say is that I wish that it had a more meaningful skill tree thing. Like, you know how you, you could pick one of those eight weapon or what like tools? Yeah. All I care about is the fucking turret. I don't I've never even, I've never once used any of the other things. And the turret gets pretty useless does later it? on. I find it quite nice for distractions because it allows me it's to just play. It's great. It's great now. Where I'm at, it's really good, but I've heard that it gets pretty pretty useless real quick. So I have like this cache of like upgrade chips. You basically get these things like this tech. And I have like a bunch. First of all, I'm all maxed out in everything. All my skill trees are maxed out. I can't max out anything else until I get to level 30. And then I have like 35 skill chips or something, whatever the tech. Yeah. And I don't want to spend it on anything. So that's like my one conundrum. I'm like, I don't really get I hate when games have skill trees or upgrades that don't mean anything. I love these really deep borderlands is a great example, actually, of a game that does this really well. Yeah. Where I, I want to like jump in and have like meaningful ways to make my character stronger. I don't feel like the Division 2 has that. And God War is, again, just this strategy RPG I'm playing on Vita. I just play it in bed at night before I go to bed. One or two battles. It's really fun. 
But the new game that I'm playing is Phoenix Wright Trilogy. I played a little bit. Yeah, so I gave you a code. I got a code from Capcom. They sent it to me without even me asking. So I don't know if they're just being nice or they know that I'm actually a big fan of this franchise. So first of all, by the time you hear this, there should be a video review up. It's short. It's six minutes long on my SideQuest YouTube channel. And uh, these are basically ports, massively upgraded, graphically upgraded ports and interface upgrades of the Nintendo DS games we played back in the mid aughts. And these games were obviously in Japan on the Game Boy Advance originally. And I love these games. I, I got through the all of the first game except for the last episode. And then I just fucked around a bit with the second and third episodes. These games are just legal kind of thrillers where you have to kind of suspend your disbelief. The legal system doesn't really make any sense. The writing is really funny and yeah. comedic. The characters are silly. And I really feel like, as I said in my review, that this is kind of a palate cleanser game. Like, this is a great game to just have on your cross-media bar, on your console, play every once in a while. You don't need to remember anything. It's not like Sekiro, where, like, you forgot how to play. It's all in menus. None, none of it's active. You can let it just sit there forever if you want it to. It's not going to do anything. And I, I really enjoy it. And I really enjoy, especially its kind of provenance, being so important to a lot of the visual novels and adventure games we'd get later. There would be no Danganronpa and these other games that I really love without Phoenix Wright. And so I want to give a shout out to that. And by the time you guys hear this, it should be out-ish, I think. Yeah, I played the first episode and I really liked it, but then I went to bed and then I just started playing Sekiro and all these other things. So, But I, I enjoy it more than I thought I would. Yeah, I told Chris. I, I sent Chris codes once in a while and I actually texted him. Like I'm like, I really personally recommend this game if you ever want to check it out i think it's yeah. really just something different it's funny yeah it I is like funny it. it's very funny it thoroughly entertained me well i'm glad so yeah that is uh probably the biggest release of the week but we'll save that for when we get there but chris let's get into the news there's a bit of news to get through this week number one borderlands 3 was rumored forever announced last week and now it has a release date and it's a lot sooner than you might have thought the long-awaited third game in the core Borderlands franchise, the first since 2012, comes to PlayStation 4 on September 13th. Additionally, new details have emerged about the game. Most interestingly, that it comes packing the very rare in this era, split-screen co-op, with auto-balancing for those on different levels, and that loot will now be available to all characters in co-op, and not just the person who gets to it first or claims it first, which was a big deal in the Borderlands 2 world. Yeah. The release date is very soon. I like this. I didn't expect this because th they seemed a lot more disorganized than I had thought. But this <laughs> yeah. indicates that this game is in probably some sort of alpha form and probably fully playable, which is really surprising to me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually getting a little bit more excited as it kind of gets closer. Weirdly, I'm starting to kind of like Borderlands more than I thought I did. That's as great it gets hear. closer, which is great. Also, the cover, the box art for this new one looks awesome. With like, I love, it's one of the up. nicest box arts I've, I've seen this generation, probably even in the last like. 10 years it'll be interesting to see how this game does it doesn't come out it borderlands 2 dominated its environment you might remember i remember when borderlands 2 came out in 2012 it was all about like shift keys and for people that don't know like gearbox would just give away these keys that would give you special loot and they were always giving them away on twitter and it was just this big thing and all yeah. the website it was borderlands 2 is very much part of that 2012 2013 zeitgeist and i wonder if borderlands 3 can actually pierce this ecosystem because there are so many games like it yeah now. i don't know if it can in the same way but i think it, i think it's still probably going to stick out in the way that it stuck out back then because even even if you know you can trace the blueprint of uh borderlands into like destiny and and anthem and the division i still think there's some sort of personality and atmosphere there that isn't necessarily in the other things we'll see how they kind of ba you know balance that humor too like you were yeah. saying borderlands one's a little more subtle borderlands two is a little bit more over the top also, there was that 2K Australia Borderlands, the pre-sequel, which I don't think they really count as part of their own franchise, but I didn't know what the writing was in that game. I played it for a little while. I didn't like it. I didn't play it at all. It felt weird. Number two, this past week, the entertainment publication Variety related word on some interesting Fortnite related chatter from none other <laughs> than the UK's Prince Harry. At a London YMCA, Prince Harry reportedly said that the game Fortnite, quote, shouldn't be allowed, end quote, because, quote, it's created to addict. An addiction to keep you in front of a computer for as long as possible. It's so irresponsible. Ellipsis. Parents have got their hands up. They don't know what to do about it. It's like waiting for the damage to be done. It's more dangerous because it's normalized and there are no restrictions to it. We are in a mind altering time without that human connection. When you do have a problem, you have nowhere to go. The only place you might go is online and you will probably end up getting bullied. End quote. <laughs> I had to include this. Actually, I wrote on my notebook here behind me that I think I want to call this episode Prince Harry hates video games because I think that's just funny. Yeah, but I wanted to bring this up because this is so strange. I know we have a lot of parents listening to this episode in this podcast. Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me with this? <laughs> this quote of saying 
it's waiting for the damage to be done. And he also says parents have got their hands up. Well, why don't you like, just be a parent? Like they're in the classroom, like waiting to get picked on. Trying or to figure they out just to don't do. know what to do. They're, they're flabbergasted by their children playing Fortnite. I wanted to include this only because I thought it was so strange. The monarch, one of the monarchs of the UK shirking the responsibility of parenting. Yeah. In video games. That's really the takeaway. I know a lot of people were making fun of this and Fortnite and all this. And yeah, I agree with Harry about Fortnite. And I'm like, all right, it's funny. But oh, yeah, yeah. There's, a part, a, there's a part of my brain that's like, oh, no, not Fortnite. Right. But like from a principal standpoint, it's like, no, absolutely. What are you what are you talking about? Really strange. The idea that video games are the cause of this is, is mind blowing, too, because it's like I feel like social media is far more damaging than video games could ever hope to be. Oh, definitely. Like b- beyond any shred of a, a reasonable doubt, in my opinion. No, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, he does say one accurate thing. The only place you might go is online and you will probably end up getting bullied. That's yeah. true. I think he's right about the lack of human connection. But that, that, again, that, that's not a video game thing. No, it's if not. anything. It's kind of the opposite with video games. It's not a Fortnite thing either. And that's a good point. Fortnite is kind of a game where you play with other people and you can talk with other people yeah. and you're gathering with other people. You would think you would be more concerned with single player gamers or like weebs and all the, you know, yeah. why isn't Prince Harry outspoken about the weeb culture? <laughs> the weebs are taking over. I just thought this was strange. I wanted to bring that up. Prince it was, Harry. It was definitely weird. Stop encouraging people uh, this behavior. Try being parents. My parents parented me. I, I don't understand this whole thing about like, I can't control my child playing Fortnite. It's like, what are you, what are you saying? You absolutely can. Like, what fucking universe do you live in where don't you can't kid. control you, your kid if playing if you Fortnite? Think, if you think you can't control your kid playing Fortnite, then don't have, don't have a kid. No, don't. <laughs> don't do that. You all did us a great disservice by having children to begin with. <laughs> Number three. So in, nuclear. In an interview with IGN, Toshihiro Nagoshi the head of Sega's Yakuza studio in Japan, spoke candidly about the recent drama surrounding the Yakuza spinoff Judgment, which recently came out in Japan and had to be pulled from store shelves due to one of the main characters being portrayed by a Japanese actor recently indicted on cocaine-related charges. So we have talked about this already. Just wanted to set this up. There's more to this, though. The actor's name is Pierre Takai, or Taki, and the character he portrayed is Kiyohei Hamura. Drug-related charges that would be considered mild in the West or even non-existent are often incredibly serious in the Japanese legal system, and Sega isn't the only company to take action. As we noted weeks ago, this actor is also a voice actor in the Japanese version of Disney's Frozen and in Square Enix's Kingdom Hearts 3 and is also being replaced there. So we are all caught up on what we know so far. As far as the work that went into it, Nagoshi told IGN, quote, First of all, we had to replace the character model and re-record all of the dialogue. But replacing the character model is only the start. We had to change all of the pre-rendered cutscenes Hamura appeared in. Also, his face appears in some of the evidence that you present on your smartphone. So we had to replace those textures. And some trophies had to be changed too, end quote. According to IGN, Sega acted quickly once word of the drug charges came down. And within an hour of them finding out, they had decided he needed to be replaced. Quote, there was an option to leave it as it was. But personally, I felt strongly that changing the character was the right decision. It's hard to know how big the risks are. If the game had already been on sale for several years, I don't know what the outcome could have been. But this was just three months after the Japanese release, so it was still hot. And I think that requires a sensitive approach, end quote. Due to their quick decision making, the game won't be delayed in the West and is still coming to PS4 on June 25th in the US, Canada, Europe and elsewhere. What a strange saga. It's so weird. As far as I understand, I, I don't know everything about the story with this Pierre Tacky guy, but I don't know if he even had much of a possession of cocaine. I think he might have just did cocaine. Oops. The act of doing drugs being illegal is so weird to me. The act of selling them is fine, but what the act of doing them is illegal. It's just it doesn't really make any sense. It's, well, J- Japan, I guess, can do what they want, but uh, it looks like this guy's pretty much done. So yeah. in that culture. Good Lord, that's such a drastic approach. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's totally insane. Number four, Square Enix is experiencing a bit of a shakeup. Longtime producer of the Tales JRPG series, Hideo Ababa, has officially left the recent post at the publisher, which he joined to many people's surprise back in early 2017. Baba was a big get for Square Enix as the Tale series is one of the world's most persistently popular JRPG franchises, and he had a big role to play in that at Namco Bandai. Square Enix replaced him as the head of an all-new internal team called Studio Istolia, and they were working on a game mysteriously titled Project Prelude Rune. But Kotaku relays word from Japanese publication Famitsu that this partnership is no more. In a statement, Baba said, quote, Accompanying a change in Studio Istolia's management policies, I'm announcing that I resigned as representative director in December of 2018 to make room for the next generation. Also, in March 2019, I resigned from Square Enix, end quote. Interestingly, this isn't the only high-level talent to leave Square Enix as of the last few weeks. Silicon Era reports that Hiroaki Awano has also left Square Enix. Awano is best known for the Million Arthur series, a mobile-centric card-based RPG that's quite big in Japan, but that never made it to Western markets. 
Gamatsu also reports that Naoki Hamaguchi, who is known as the project lead of Final Fantasy VII's mysterious remake, has been promoted to co-director of the game alongside Tetsuya Nomura. So some shakeups over at Square Enix. This Hideo Baba thing, Chris, I know is not a big deal to you, but Hideo Baba is a really, really big name in Japanese role playing games. And he's the producer of the Tale series at Namco Bandai for a really long time, left that post probably for a lot of money to go make a role playing game for Square Enix. That didn't seem to work out. What I'm interested in is if he goes back yeah. uh, to Bandai Namco, which would be very interesting. Number five, GameStop, the enormous American based games retailer, has posted the single worst financial results in the company's history. GameStop reported a year-long operating loss of $673 million, and according to website Ars Technica, is the single biggest annual loss GameStop ever declared, and interestingly, only the third annual loss of any kind it ever posted. Net sales are down 3% year over year, with an expectation of further eroding sales by as much as 10 additional percent over the next 12 months. GameStop shares are currently trading on the market at their lowest value since 2005. GameStop hit its peak stock value in 2013. Anthony Lencioni wrote into us on Patreon about this, Chris. He says, hey, CNC, I wrote in around Black Friday and said that I don't think GameStop would make it to Black Friday 2019. And you commented saying that you didn't think that that was going to happen. Do you now think that with GameStop posting its most recent loss of over $600 million, that this is actually a possibility? Thanks for the quality content and make Tuesdays great again. We already have made Tuesdays great again. Anthony Lencioni. Chris, what do you think? Do you think that this company will make it to Black Friday? I remember this letter. That's why I wanted to have Anthony yeah, chime in I again. think it will. I don't know if it'll last much longer than that. I, th I think it's a very, <laughs> it's in a very precarious situation. I think a lot of people, a lot of companies in general, that you, we've seen a lot of layoffs in general over the last like couple months. I think a lot of it is just because people don't know where to put their money. <laughs> and honestly, I thought GameStop would have been gone way before this. So I wouldn't be surprised if it stuck around a little bit longer. To me, though... It's weird because they just, I think recently or either sometime last year, they started investing in like esports or something. They started investing in like either curating them or like in, in their own teams or something. I read some report that they were like doing esports stuff. Yeah, they, they have been spreading their wings. I think that's true. And they've also like kind of made investments in weird ways. Game Trust is their publishing arm. Yeah. And but they've not really published anything useful. They own that cricket or what? Well, no, Spring Wireless or whatever it was, which they sold for six hundred million dollars, which I didn't see mentioned in any of the articles, but I think that their loss would have been over a billion dollars if they didn't sell the company and Ugh. make make a profit off of it, a significant profit off of it. But like we've said in the past, in the few times I've gone into the store, it just it's unrecognizable compared to the GameStops and Funko Lands and whatever EBs that I grew up with. Oh, yeah. Where it was just games on shelves and you just that was basically it and maybe some toys and shit. But now it's just like a hot topic that happens to sell video games. And I just don't know that that's tan like I, I don't. I don't see how this lasts that much longer. I, I, so, Mr. Lencioni, to your point, no, I don't think GameStop's going away. They're actively seeking a buyer. They have been actively seeking some sort of investment from a capital firm for a while. So I don't think they're going anywhere, but they're seriously or obviously. In, yeah, there's nobody in ever in there when I go in. I go in there out of curiosity. I was like, I went in. <laughs> I went in over the weekend uh, and I was like, hey, can I get a, a, an Xbox One Elite controller? And they're like, nah, we don't have them. <laughs> And I just walked out. And that was, that's the GameStop experience for me. I don't want people to lose their jobs. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs as this thing starts to go down. But it's just the market speaking and they're just not good enough. I've had fucking horrible experiences at GameStop, like straight up yeah. long before anything bad was happening to them. I think I I don't know if I said this. People that have been with me for a long time will know when I was at Northeastern, we came out when I was a senior and I went to GameStop in December of that year, like mid-December in Boston at Prudential Center. And I went to the GameStop there and I was like, hey, uh, do you guys have any Wii's? And he's like, I do. Like, because you remember Wii's were like, really? really? Yeah. And I'm like, I remember just staring at him being like, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> I like that. You know, and I was like, fuck you, dude. <laughs> fuck this place. I appreciate the snideness of that. <laughs> I do. What an asshole. Yeah. What a dickhole. <laughs> I remember his stupid fucking swarmy face, too. Uh, Ryan Lemieux wrote into us on Patreon about this and said, with all the talk of GameStop not being long for this world, I wonder if I'm the only one who actually likes buying physical media anymore. I actually enjoy the experience of going to my local GameStop and chatting with the employees that work there. I'm actually bummed out that someday it's only going to be pop figurines and t-shirts if anything at all. Do you guys have any love for the experience of going into brick and mortar stores and purchasing a game? Yeah, I think I think the general loss of brick and mortar stores is going to be really sad and depressing. Overall, just not even in GameStop, just in general. I feel like a lot of stores are probably just going to go away and Amazon's probably going to wipe the floor with everything. I miss uh, midnight releases back when that used to happen. Like, it was always this great party. 
You just go there at midnight and talk to random people that you've never met before that all have this really common, really hyper-focused interest in the same thing. You meet some people for the first time that you talk to for like years. It's, it's awesome. It's a great experience. But it, in recent years, that's stopped. So like I imagine it's probably just going to go away entirely and physical media is probably going to be relegated to maybe the places like Best Buy maybe. If Best Buy even stays around, I remember that Best Buy was having trouble too. So Lord knows. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I, I was thinking the other day, Circuit City. Remember Circuit City? Like, yeah, they, I do. They went out of business. I got my PS2 at Circuit City. The last thing I bought at Circuit City before they went out of business was Endless Ocean on the Wii. That's the last thing I got. Endless Ocean was that weird ass yeah. swimming simulator, basically. That I, was when I was. I remember like, I liked Circuit City because it was red, and I didn't yeah. like GameStop, or, or I didn't, and I didn't like Best Buy because it was blue. Oh, that's interesting. I like blue more, but I liked. So well, every, everybody, plug thing. everybody likes Blue more, which is why Best Buy's around and Blu-ray's around and HD DVD, HD, what was that Blu-ray competitor? HD DVD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was what was on That Xbox. was red and that didn't work. No. People don't like different. red. It's too aggressive, I guess. It is very pansies, aggressive. Pansies, a bunch of your pansies, all of you. Apparently it makes you hungry, though, the, the color red and yellow. Those colors Explains are kind of Explains why there's so many red stripes in the United States flag. Yeah. We have we're a hunger all for, so obese. We have a hunger for blood. Now, I will say that Anthony, or I'm sorry, that Ryan wrote in about physical media, and I think we're conflating two things. I think people still like, I mean, clearly people still like getting physical media. It's just like, why go through the trouble anymore? This is kind of the problem of convenience. I don't fucking buy almost anything in stores. I couldn't tell you, though. I think since I've lived in Los Angeles for two years now, I don't think I've been in a box store one time, like once, not once. I don't think I've gone to the supermarket. I go to the mall down the street. I don't think I've been in a Target or like a Walmart or anything like that and since I left San Francisco. And... I don't know that you really need to use a lot of these stores anymore. So it's sad, but we're kind of facilitating with our actions, with our habits, the death of these merchants, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, Ryan, I, I think people do have a love for it, but it's being overwhelmed by people's love of laziness and sedentariness, you know, and I don't blame you. It's going to be Wally here pretty soon. Yeah. Actually, for real, no, no joke. Number six, eagerly anticipated Super Meat Boy Forever the sequel to the very popular, brutally difficult platformer Super Meat Boy, has been delayed and will no longer launch on PS4 this month. However, it's the candor and why the game is delayed that is perhaps most notable. While originally aiming for the April 2019 release date internally, developer Team Meat realized it simply wasn't going to be able to hit the deadline, meet its quality expectations, and perhaps most importantly, remain healthy as a studio. In a Twitter post, Team Meat said, quote, We've been knocking out the last bits of Super Meat Boy forever at record speeds while keeping a healthy and sustainable pace. We are going to keep that pace, which means we will not hit our April 2019 release. Sorry about that. We could have sacrificed our minds, bodies, and social lives to make April 2019, but that's stupid. Team Meat isn't some studio owned by an evil asshat corporation that has say over what we do and how we do it. We are fortunate enough to have control over how we work, and we choose not to run ourselves into the ground. Game delays blow, we know, but we're close, so it shouldn't be too long of a delay, end quote. <laughs> I like that. I like it too, yeah. I like people being frank. It's a little bit insulting in a backwards way to those that do work at these studios. Oh, for sure, but I mean... I don't know if they mean it like that, like the evil asshat corporations that, you know... It's just strange to me because... I understand what they're saying and they're right. And that's great. Right. We, I own my own business and we go at our, you know, we choose to go at our own pace too. So I'm not criticizing them for that, but I will say to be fair, these e quote unquote evil asset corporations, they don't have a say over products being delivered on time and stuff like that. Or, you know, it's like, I think we're kind of losing the plot in the way we're talking about this. This is getting more heated. Yeah, the, maybe, uh, you know, I, I think definitely from, from my perspective, decidedly, more heated with a lot of the unionization talk and all of these exposés with studios like Bioware and everyone's miserable at fucking EA and visceral closing. And I just feel like there's a lot, you know, out there, arena net layoffs and everything. I feel like a lot of people are just like taking it out on companies driving for a profit. And that's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. You know, Team Meat is also going to run on a profit. I like what they said. I think it's great. But I do want to give the other side of the story from my perspective as well. For sure. Number seven. Ubisoft is the publisher of many popular franchises. Two such series are Assassin's Creed and The Division, and due to some cross-pollination between the two, it appears that the recently released Division 2 has subtle teasers for the next Assassin's Creed game within it. While we won't spoil what those teasers are, we will note that Kotaku's reporting seems to confirm the consensus. The main, next mainline Assassin's Creed game will revolve around the Vikings. Such a game won't come until 2020 at the earliest, as Ubisoft has previously said that 2019 will only have the launch of Assassin's Creed Odyssey DLC alongside Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered, which just came out. Number eight, publisher Bethesda and developer Avalanche have revealed that their upcoming shooter, Rage 2, is getting a splash of the old school, cheats. 
The cheats allow for NBA Jam's announcer Tim Kitzro to voice your game. <laughs> a there's a cheat that allows for one-hit kills, a cheat that electrifies enemies who get too close to you, the ability to spawn a friendly AI partner, and a lot more. Those who pre-order the deluxe edition of the game get three cheats automatically. The Tim Kitzrow cheat will be available to anyone who pre-orders the normal game. And a character called the Wasteland Wizard will, in-game, eventually make these cheats available to all for in-game currency. Bethesda claims you'll never have to pay real money for these cheats. Rage 2 comes to PS4 and elsewhere on May Okay, so I, I have an issue with this. Yeah. If you have to unlock a cheat, it's not a cheat. That's a something that's been in every every game for like a long time now. It's just a perk or like an ability or something. A cheat is something you could do regardless of where you are. And that's the whole point of a cheat is to cheat the game. That's true. You that's a good point. A pre-order cheat availability is kind of dumb to me. I don't see the point. Yeah, it's a Don't good, call them cheats. They're yeah. not cheats. That's an interesting point. I mean, it's a totally fair point. I'm more concerned by how the cheats work within the nature of the game. Yeah. Do, does it disable trophies? Are you able to co-op with people with cheats? One hit kills and these electri electrification skills and stuff sound very powerful. So that sounds like something on a on a skill tree, though. Like, doesn't it? Like yeah. electrify enemies near you. That's literally that's a, a Bioshock yeah. A tonic. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like what? I like that they're, you know, maybe it's a marketing ploy. Maybe it's even working on. I me, like the idea yeah. of cheats. That'd be cool. Like put a big head mode in like the, like the good old days. Right. But the, these aren't cheats. These are perks or like skill tree things. That's true. Yeah. It's it, weird. It, the days, you know, I was funny when I was playing Grand Theft Auto 3 on PS4 like last year, just randomly for a little while. And I was like putting in the cheats. It's like, wow, I remember this when you could just do whatever you want. You know, you don't have to. Yeah. What was surprising in that game and that port was that you could cheat and still earn trophies and stuff like that. So, yeah. I'm like, mm, OK. But like, how does spawning a friendly AI companion differ from the turret into Division 2? Terminology is a bit weird. I am looking forward to that game, though. Yeah, no, it looks cool. Number nine. Sony has revealed the top downloaded games for the PlayStation Network for the month of March 2019. The most downloaded PS4 games were in order. The Division 2, MLB 19, the show at number two. It was only out for a very small, short amount of time, too. That really goes to show you how big that game is. Yeah. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, Devil May Cry 5, Grand Theft Auto 5, NBA 2K19, Minecraft, Far Cry New Dawn, Rainbow Six Siege, and FIFA 19. The top 10 most downloaded PSVR games were in order. Beat Saber, Job Simulator, Super Hot VR, Arizona Sunshine, PlayStation VR Worlds, Gun Club VR, Until Dawn Rush of Blood, Surgeon Simulator, Astro Bot Rescue Mission, and Borderlands 2 VR. The top 10 most downloaded Vita games were in order. Jack and Daxter Collection, Trillion God of Destruction, Mary Skelter Nightmares, God of War Collection, Metal Gear Solid 3 HD, Persona 4 Golden, Super Dimension Neptune vs. Sega Hard Girls, which I know is Chris's favorite game, <laughs> Minecraft, Cosmic Star Heroine, and Metal Gear Solid 2 HD. The most popular free-to-play game of the month was Apex Legends, followed by Fortnite. And the most popular PS Classic of the month was Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, followed by Bully. Two Rockstar games. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. They were really, really ahead of the game of getting their PS2 games on yeah. PS4. And finally, number 10 is a wrap-up. The PlayStation blog has revealed that party game Brief Battles is coming to PS4 on May 7th. That so-called action bartending game Valhalla, which is spelled VA-11 and then Hall-A, comes to PS4 on May 2nd, and that open-ended open-world game Ancestors, the Humankind Odyssey, which looks pretty cool, comes to PlayStation 4 later this year. Website Gamatsu reports that Samurai Showdown, which we knew was PS4 bound in June, has a firmer release date of June 27th. That visual novel slash adventure game Nurse Love Syndrome is Vita bound next week on April 19th. That farming game Forager is coming to PS4 in the coming months. That platformer Furwind is coming to both PS4 and Vita at an undetermined time. And that adventure game Path to Miss... What is this? News, new, Numosign. It's M-N-E-M-O-S-Y-N-E. -E. Path to Numosign, I guess. Also comes to PS4 next week on April 16th. Silicon Era reports that Metroidvania sequel La Mulana 2 is coming to PS4 on June 27th, and that Sony and Bandai Namco have randomly delisted PS1 classic Mr. Driller from the North American PlayStation Store, meaning that it can no longer be purchased for PS3 and Vita. We don't know why this happened. This might have something to do. People are thinking this might have something to do with, like, PS Classic because this it's is on like, PS Classic. Yeah, and this is like maybe the most the game that people really want most on it. But I, <laughs> I don't think so. I, I doubt I, that. I, I really, <laughs> can you imagine? You can only play Mr. Driller, the killer app of Mr. Driller on the PS Classic. Yeah, that seemed a little too weird to me. And finally, Push Square reports that racing game Pacer is coming to PS4 later this year, and that co-op action game Unruly Heroes is PS4 bound in the coming months. I want a new Wipeout game. Well, I'm not going to get one from Studio Liverpool because they do not exist anymore. Okay. Chris, rest in peace. It's time to read the new game releases. I have no agenda. You can go first right. or second. I'll go first because I like this first one. Okay. Airport Simulator 2019 comes to PS4. You are the manager of a major international airport. Gradually, you will earn experience and your airport will grow. New runways and gates will be added and larger planes will arrive. No time to rest. 
So I was reading this and I was it thinking... It sounds stressful. I, I got stressed out while I was reading First it. of all, I find it stressful as well. An air, the job of the air traffic controller is apparently like horrifying. Oh, yeah. And it's in no time to rest. You might want to rest a little bit. The, people's lives are in your hands here in the airport simulator. But I did was reading this and I'm like, you know, I bet you this game is good. Now, I, I want to sit down and play one of these games one day. These games come out. And I'm like, you know, this game's probably fun. Construction. I'm sorry. Constructor Plus comes to PS4. In this town, you've got to think big. Take on the role of a budding property developer and build yourself up from minor league housing crook to interplanetary property tycoon, wheeling, dealing, and thieving all the way. Wow, okay. Dangerous Driving comes to PS4. Dangerous Driving is a game about the sort of driving you want to do when no one else is looking. This game gives you the chance to live out that fantasy, to floor it in e into everyday cars... Uh, oh, to floor it in everyday cars at high speeds, weaving in and out of traffic and slamming the other cards off the, ro off the road. You struggled a little bit with that one. I struggled a little bit. Dark Quest 2 came to PS4, comes to PS4. Dark Quest 2 is a turn-based RPG where you control a party of heroes on your epic quest to defeat the evil sorcerer and his minions. Each map is designed to test your party's strength, courage, and sanity as you go deeper and deeper into the castle seeking the evil sorcerer. There is nothing more generic than not only the name of the game, Dark Quest 2. But the first sentence, Dark Quest 2 is a turn-based RPG where you control a party of heroes on your epic quest to defeat the evil sorcerer and his minions. That's every role-playing Yeah, it is pretty much. <laughs> wow. Earth Defense Force Iron Rain comes to PS4. I actually played a little bit of this at PAX. The year is 20, 2040, an action third-person shooter where you will become one of the Earth Defense Force soldiers and fight against the invaders from outer space, which ruined the world. More than 50 missions in, fi in five difficulties await your challenge. I've always wanted to play that series. I never have. There's just so many games that I don't know where to even it's jump in. It's a really good middle market kind of turn your brain off kind of weird action oriented game. It seems like a Masso, but with guns. It seems kind like of. It, yeah. yeah, it's not too far off. This new one has grappling hooks also. So. Oh, well, there you go. Falcon Age comes to PS4 and PSVR. Falcon Age is a first person single player action adventure. As Ara learned to hunt, gather and fight to reclaim her cultural legacy in the lost art of, Al of falcon hunting against a force of automated colonizers. Bond with the baby falcon and go on an adventure. This is on the uh, that PlayStation, the state of play, right? Uh, yes, it was. Ghost 1.0 comes to PS4. A mysterious agent capable of becoming a digital ghost. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Sneaks aboard the Nakamura Space Station. This is where the fun begins. The station is well protected with its heavy defenses, a never-ending arsenal of weapons, and mysterious artifacts. It will all... What? It will all have to be destroyed. It will all have to be destroyed. So you play as a mysterious agent? I don't... Mysterious Are you a agent? ghost? Yeah, a digital ghost. I love digital ghosts. Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Trilogy comes to PS4. Highly recommended by yours truly. Become Phoenix Wright and experience the thrill of battle as you fight to save your innocent clients in a court of law. Play all 14 episodes spanning the first three games in one gorgeous collection. Solve the intriguing mysteries behind each case and witness the final truth for yourself. Royal Roads comes to PS4. There was once a princess named Lena in a magical kingdom sent far from home by an evil witch's spell. Travel together with the princess, savor the beauty of her kingdom, make new friends and overcome obstacles together to break the cruel spell and return home. Shadowgate comes to PS4. I'm really interested in playing this. Shadowgate is one of the most beloved adventure titles in history, in gaming history. This new console version builds upon the massively reimagined remake of the original Shadowgate and features a refined user interface and intuitive wheel-based icon command system to help players along on their quests. Shadowgate, of course, is a classic. <laughs> I love the way this next one's written. It's written like a commercial, kind of. Super Weekend Mode comes to PS4 and PS Vita. No matter how you look at it, there is nothing nice about stealing. And unfortunately for a princess, she's going to have to learn this the hard way when that guy claims her possessions for himself and sets off with them. That guy in quotes. <laughs> Seems interesting. Ultra Wings Flat comes to PS4. Pilot multiple aircraft to complete a variety of missions across a beautifully stylized open world. Pop balloons, perform in thrilling air races, take photos, and so much more. Ultra Wings is truly the ultimate hobbyist aircraft game for the PS4. Vaporum comes to PS4. Vaporum is a, gr a grid-based dungeon crawler RPG in an original steampunk setting inspired by old-school classics of the genre. Stranded in the middle of an ocean in front of a gigantic tower, the hero has to find out what the place is, what happened there, and most importantly, who he is. All right. Sounds like a thing. Final game is Zonky Zero Last Beginning comes to <laughs> PS4. Explore the ruins, dungeons, and islands in this post-apocalyptic world through the POV, or point of view, of eight protagonists in each chapter and explore the dungeons, towers, and islands to uncover the deadly sins of the protagonist's past as they fight for survival. This game's actually really interesting because it comes from the Danganronpa people and apparently is really a spiritual successor in some way to it 
although it's a role playing game and not really an adventure game. Hmm. I want to look more into it because I love me some Danganronpa. All Those right. are all of the games, Chris. Anything to recommend here? I would assume only Phoenix Wright from me. Dangerous yeah. Driving from you. Yeah, I would say so. I would recommend Phoenix also. Phoenix Wright. All right, Chris, as we always do on Sacred Symbols, we end with eight questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience. Remember, if you support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand, you can get early ad free access to every episode of Sacred Symbols and also the ability to submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas, your queries, if you will, and exclusive podcasts and other perks as well. The first of eight comes from Brent Linquist, who says, hey, fellas. I'm writing in about the recent controversy regarding the lack of easy difficulty options in certain video games, specifically difficult ones like From Software's Souls and Souls-like titles. With the recent release of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, an article on Forbes brought about a wave of takes calling for an easy mode to be added to Sekiro. These pieces note that easy modes can be helpful for people with disabilities and that these gamers are not necessarily looking for easier games, but rather more accessible ones. What are your thoughts on the notion of putting easy modes into games that are difficult by design? Is an easy mode even the answer or are accessibility options like the ones in Celeste a better idea? Thanks for all that you do. Just to kind of frame this, Celeste has an interesting thing. Celeste is a really, really tough puzzle platformer that has an easy mode that basically just won't let you die. And weirdly, it keeps the trophies on, which is stupid. Now, I've kind of ping ponged <laughs> on this topic back and forth, Chris. I, I don't know. Like, I had a little bit of a conversation with a, accessibility, a couple accessibility experts on Twitter and have been kind of voicing my opinions on this. My take is simple, mm -hmm. that I think that there's a conflation between accessibility options and what access means and easy modes and scaling games down. I think they're two different things. I agree. I think they're two different arguments. Yeah. And I'm all about access, but I am not necessarily all about dumbing a game down. But in all of my time wringing my mind about this, I can't really come up with a reasonable and fair reason why I don't necessarily support dumbing down games for other people. That's kind of my take. Huh. What do you think? I don't know. Accessibility, I think, is something that's pretty objectively and <laughs> inarguably positive. I think the stuff that Xbox is doing with their adaptive controller is really cool and uh, something that Sony should look into and maybe Nintendo also. The thing with difficulty in regards to Soulsborns and Sekiro specifically is that I feel like the entire point of the game is to get over obstacles that were at one point for you very challenging. I think that's the whole point of those games. So to make those easier, I don't even know how you would really make the game easier without completely redesigning it or making it a completely different game because it's not like you can just give yourself more health because then that just makes fighting kind of redundant and boring if you don't have to time your attacks in Sekiro then the game's not really there so I, I don't really know how I feel about it either if I'm being completely honest I, I was thinking of doing a video on it just because I feel like I have to explore it a little bit more but I think Sekiro should be what Sekiro is and if they want to put an easy mode I'm not going to scream to the heavens about it but at the same time I, I, I do like the idea that if somebody says, I beat Sekiro or I beat Bloodborne, there's some kind of implicit kind of, oh, that means something. It, it's still one of those games that you beat. It's not like The Last of Us where, oh, did you finish The Last of Us? Oh, did you finish so-and-so? Did you finish this game? Did you finish that game? No, did you did you beat Sekiro? And I kind of like that that's still around in some form. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think that there's this concern, and I think it's a reasonable concern about this idea of gatekeeping. And you see it a yeah. lot in nerd verticals, right? And there's this need to kind of keep gaming pure in some way, whatever that means by, you know, difficulty or whatever the case might be. And, you know, it's funny because I can kind of relate to this. I don't consider, maybe other people do, but I don't consider myself much of a gatekeeper, but I understand, especially for older gamers, why, and this really has nothing to do with this particular conversation, but just generally speaking, that gamers kind of want to keep their space because it's hard for younger people. It might even really be hard for you to understand, frankly, that because you're 10 years younger mm -hmm. than me, where... Yeah. I still think sometimes I'm like, how is it possible that Game of Thrones is like the biggest show on te television? When I was 10 or 15 years old, if you were watching a show like Game of Thrones, you were a fucking dork and a nerd. Yeah. And the point I'm trying like to Firefly. make is that Firefly, great example, <laughs> right? And so for me, when I see the kind of mainstream nature of gaming, the mainstream nature of all these things now, I embrace it because I think it's really good for our medium. It draws more people in. I really do believe gaming is for everybody. But I also understand that urge to keep gaming for the gamers, as it were, like this was our place. This was our refuge before it was cool, before it was accepted. And I'm like, yeah, I get it, but I don't think it's a healthy mentality. Right. Yeah. So that's just one component of it. The other component, I think, is the conflation, like I said, of access and design philosophies. But also, I think the conflation of gaming being for everyone, which it is, 
and every game being for everyone, yeah. which can't possibly be true. No, exactly. Like, I'm not somebody who is keen on strategy games because to me it's just too much for me to care about like it's just it's a lot of management and stuff that i just don't really want to deal with there's no amount of dumbing down that's going to make a strategy game my favorite genre of game just because it's just it's just not my deal i understand that it's hard for me and i consider it a little bit harder than i i necessarily would want to you know spend my time on but it's not going to do anything for me to make it easier i would rather the people who enjoy that genre enjoy that genre and then just i, I don't need to be appealed to i think that with accessibility that's a different thing. And games are like super accessible now compared right. to like way more now than they ever were in the past. Right. Exactly. I just think that there's almost a disservice being done to the conversation of access, generally speaking. Yeah. When you really start getting into like, well, now the game's too hard. And I'm like, but that's not the traditional. That's not, ex- that's not the traditional definition of access. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> like if you want to change the definition, because some of these guys, you know, especially people that are disabled uh, that I've spoken to a couple people or that are kind of activist disabled people that work for this, they're like, well, I know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, dude, I respect that. But there's no denying that you're changing the definition of accessibility. Yeah, the adaptive controller is very cool. And they had that really touching, con- you know, commercial for it that Xbox did and taking things into account for people like colorblindness or deafness. Yeah. These things make sense. I remember when that game Hue came to Vita and PS4, which is a game I really love that's all based on colors. I remember interviewing them and thinking I was about to nail them, being like, what if you're colorblind? And I'm like, no, we thought about that. We have symbols in the game over each color. So that color, and I'm like, oh, okay. So that's like, the, or you shouldn't have audio cues, right? There are games with audio cues that I think are sloppy because it's like, what if you're deaf? These are the things that you should kind of keep in mind. Yeah. But then like when you come to a game where it's like, it's just too hard. I don't know that this is an access issue because I go back to... I use the example of EVE Online. That game is incredibly fucking complicated. I wouldn't yeah, have no, any clue how to play EVE Online. That's kind of my problem. No, exactly. You know, like, I, do, should I go to CCP and be like, you got to make an easier version of EVE because well, it's, my, it's not it's, accessible? Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. It's not my, it's the same problem with me and strategy games. I could probably learn how to play a strategy game or like a, a really in-depth, I could probably learn how to play EVE. I just don't really feel like it's worth my time or feel like I want to. Sekiro, I, I, I'm playing it pretty much every day it's not a hard game it's just a game that's that challenges you and and i know it's not a hard game because the early parts in the game where you're getting messed up and just ravaged by these people in the early game you can go back and decimate them using the same exact tactics that you've learned throughout the game it's like it's not about having a health buff it's not about having like a stronger weapon just straight up you're you get better as you play and you can you just master it like that's the whole point of it it's not that it's a hard game it just takes patience and if you don't have that patience, I understand that. I didn't have that patience for a long time. I don't give a shit about Dark Souls because I was like, no, that's too much for me. I'm, I'm done. But maybe now I'm like reconsidering it. Maybe yeah. now I might go back and play it. That's good. That's good to hear. It's good to be open minded. And I think that's the open mindedness that I'm really trying to kind of lean on with this particular conversation because I am definitely yeah. divided. I, I don't really have like a strong feeling about it one way or yeah. the other. I really just feel like the conflating of the terms doesn't do anyone any justice. And I just have a hard time with the idea that every game should be for every person. I think that's yeah. just fucking nuts. That's impossible. Yeah. It's, it's just unreasonable. But it's a lot. It is a lot of people just kind of having different conversations at each other <laughs> is what it seems like. Definitely. And so, you know, there's this naughty dog, uh, for instance, talked a lot about how <clears throat> I think during uncharted three, someone wrote into them and saying like, there's a button prompt thing where you have to like press the button really quick. And no matter what difficulty level they're on, you still have to press the button really quick and you couldn't press it quickly enough because of some disability he had. So they got rid of things like that or had the option to turn those things off. I think working away around like your interface and working around all of those kind of things where, OK, you can't deal with QTE. So we're just not going to yeah. put that into this game. I think that's reasonable. I think no, that's yeah. a reasonable design philosophy. Well, but specifically again, because <laughs> QTEs aren't hard. They're just kind of annoying. It's what I said to someone on Twitter. You can't follow this to its logical conclusion. You can't. I think at some point you have to kind of give people the tools necessary to play or the tools necessary to access something. And you shouldn't want to gatekeep and you shouldn't want to keep people away. But you also have to embrace the idea that just like I can't play EVE online and I'm, I have no prayer of playing an, a competitive Overwatch game or something. Sekiro just might not be for you. You know, and there are a million other literally a million other games to play. Yeah. So. I am divided on this conversation. I'm sensitive to it. Yeah. But I really think that like disabilities and access, that means something. And now we're just totally making it into something else. And I don't think it's productive or healthy. 
I, I think I want to make a video about it. Adam Connor wrote into us and said, hi, CNC. So with the recent release of Borderlands 1 on PS4, which we oh. were talking about above, I was wondering what your guys' opinion is on these remakes being advertisements for other games. If you haven't played it, you're greeted by a big ad for Borderlands 3, and there is a banner in the top right of the screen and a pre-order Borderlands 3 option on the main menu. Did you see all of this? I did, yeah. I know that there are subtle ways of doing this, like the Sly Cooper trilogy on PS3, but what do you think of the case of Borderlands? Keep up the great work, and thanks for making Tuesdays great again. For the Sly Cooper thing that he's mentioned, when the Sly Cooper trilogy came to PS3 back in the day, if you beat all three games, you would unlock a trailer for an unannounced Sly Cooper game. That was kind of, I think that's actually different and very cool. Yeah. In this game, what he's saying is that they're just teasing immediately Borderlands 3 and using it as an advertisement. Do you find it destructive to the experience? You seemed like you really enjoyed it. You didn't even bring that up. Actually. No, it, it's I mean, I'm used to these live service games that have like message of the days, you know, and I remember even even the the old Halo games like Halo 3 did this where they when Reach was coming out. It's like, hey, there's a message. Hey, Reach is coming out soon. Hey, the Reach bait is coming out. When Halo Reach came out, hey, Halo 4 is coming out. It's I, I'm just sort of used to that kind of thing. So the fact that they had one splash screen that showed Borderlands 3 is like, yeah, of course, this is a nine year old game. I, I, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't you know it right just, yeah it just it makes perfect sense it doesn't hinder the game in any way it's just a quick splash screen that goes away forever the moment you click out of it so um and chances are anybody who's <laughs> playing this is probably interested in borderlands 3 or if you're playing this for the first time and you didn't know that there was a borderlands 3 maybe that maybe that's good for you that you know yeah i think it's, I a, think it's it sounds like a very effective ad yeah i will say that there are dynamic ads in games if you guys play fifa and other sports games there are ads in there that are constantly generated not only for other games but for products so it's not that, you know, I think even Gran Turismo has like ads and stuff. So I, I don't think that it's that unusual. It is a little weird to put it in your face, but I think Chris is right. I think that that's actually a great service to Borderlands, uh, you know, the, the GOTY collection or whatever they're calling it, because a lot of people don't know that Borderlands 3 is coming out or won't know. Yeah, it's a good way to get the message out. And uh, I still think the remaster is a bit underwhelming compared to like other remasters that I've seen. But the, I, I don't know how much of that is on their end or just the fact that the game just still looks good. Right. <laughs> it's weird. Adam Laws wrote into us, Chris, and said, hey, Colin and Chris, hope you all are doing well. I wanted to get your opinion on the Mega Man Battle Network series. Is this a series you have ever played on I Game played Boy Advance? I played a little bit of it. I was not a fan. OK, with the collections coming from Capcom, I would love to see this happen, but I don't know if there's enough fan love for the series. Any thoughts? As always, keep up the amazing work. Adam, this is a great question. So a Mega Man Battle Network, I have to use my. I was like an isom the, It was isometric, right? Yeah. And it was yeah. basically like grid based. It was like a role playing game where yeah. you basically in the game you were calling it jacking in using <laughs> Mega Man.exe to fight in like computer servers yeah, and you were yeah. basically the original I'm trying to use my almost savant like release date calendar in my head I think Battle Network was a generally GBA game and I want to say it came out when I was still in high school so I want to say it came out in like 2002 maybe but uh, I really there was five of them as I recall and then there were some like different versions of it it was eventually replaced by a series called Star Force which was not very good and that happened in like 2007 but these games were good. These were good Game Boy Advance. I think there might have been Nintendo DS ones as well, but definitely Game Boy Advance. And I liked them. Mm. And I think it's other than Mega Man and Mega Man X, I think that's probably the best version of Mega Man. And I would love to see them revisit this. And I I actually think it's kind of possible. If you play the Phoenix Wright games, for instance, on PS4, those are completely remade. I was actually like really shocked by how good they look, because if you go and look at the G, GBA and DS games, they don't look like that. Yeah. You know, like it's the same art and the same characters and stuff, but they just don't look like that. So it would be really cool for them to give Battle Network a similar treatment, but it would be much more complicated. And to his point, I don't know if there is a demand for it. Trent Miller wrote into us and said, hello, Colin and Chris. How's it going? Chris, how are the roaches doing? Uh, still around. And I saw that your toilet gave in. I don't know what the hell that was. That was awesome. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know what to make of it. I love that. Foam came out of it. Yeah. Like, like a lot of, of it. It's very interesting. Yeah. About a month ago, I upgraded to a PS4 Pro because my base PS4 was tanking. It's a shame. I've noticed how, though, with my new one, it seems to have some internet connectivity issues and will disconnect from time to time. I don't have this problem before, and I was wondering if you guys have had any issues similar or have heard of this happening at all. Keep making Tuesdays great. So this was a really controversial thing, Chris. I tweeted a few months ago. It got a lot of retweets and a lot of likes, but also people really taking umbrage with it, where I was saying, like, the PlayStation Network is totally unstable on any hardware I've ever used on it that I get disconnected constantly. I have to restart my PS4 all the time yeah. to get on the PlayStation store, to get it to work. This has like been my experience over multiple PS4s and on PS3, obviously. But then some people are like, oh, no, my, I never had a problem. Do you think that there are internet connectiv connectivity issues that could be PS4 Pro related? And have you ever experienced connectivity issues with your PlayStation? Because I'm telling you, one, I want to reiterate one more time. 
The PlayStation 4 is completely unstable with its internet connectivity. Yeah. And I say that as a person who has owned four PS4s and connected them in multiple places, in multiple cities, and had those problems. So I don't think it's just me. I have pretty much exclusively bad internet connectivity in general. Like, my apartment is just a hellscape. But I will say that I, ha I have had more problems with the PS4 than I've had with my PC or my Switch or my Xbox One X. Uh, I don't know what the deal is. I think maybe the range of the Wi-Fi is smaller or something. The only the only way that I could get it even remotely good is if I wire it directly. And even then, like sometimes, yeah, I might have to restart to get to the store. Last night, actually, it was it was take it took like ten minutes to load the PlayStation Store. When I was trying to download Dangerous Driving, I was like, "All right, I need to use the code. I need to get to the redeem code section." It always hangs, dude. It always the store it hangs always a long time. hangs. And so I don't know if it's necessarily Trent a problem with your new PS4 as much as it's a problem with the PSN. Maybe some internet problems. But again, and, and you're gonna we're gonna get it in the comments on this. A lot of people are gonna come and say, "I've never had a problem." But everybody's covered, everybody's had a problem with everything. Yeah, well, first 100%, of all, percent. Even there, yes. there might be you might have had problems that you're not aware of or that you don't care because they don't bother you that much because they don't happen all that often. But it's like when I was a kid and I, I was really like in love with my 360. And I, it died like six times. And I was like, I never had a problem. It died six times. I never had a problem. <laughs> I said that I've done I've done that. You've been there. Yeah, because it's like, yeah, you know, it died, but I love it. Right. It did, you know. Quinn Zelanko wrote in and said, hey, guys, enjoyed the quick discussion last episode on Bethesda and the Elder Scrolls 6 slash Starfield snafu. My question, though, is why is EC or ES6, so Elder Scrolls 6, so far out? Skyrim came out in 2011 and Oblivion in 2006. I thought we'd have the Elder Scrolls 6 by now, but it looks like it's going to be released more than a decade after Skyrim, at least. Do you guys think standard setting games like The Witcher 3 made Bethesda go back to the drawing board and scrap a build of Elder Scrolls 6 or are increasingly long development cycles the real driver? It's just surprising to me that it's taking so long to release the next chapter of one of Bethesda's most popular series. I don't know how you feel about this, Chris, but I think Quinn is missing a key component to this. He brought up Oblivion, which did come out in 2006, and then he brought out, he talked about Skyrim, but in there, Fallout, Fallout 3, 3 was developed, and that was the first Fallout that Bethesda Game Studios made. So it wasn't like they always owned Fallout and made all those games. Yeah. So Fallout jumped in and fucked everything up as far as I can understand. So Skyrim was probably in development for a long time following Oblivion. Then they did Fallout 3. But once Fallout 4 entered the mix and then Starfield, it caused a lot of chaos. And I think Quinn's right, though, that the expectations are just much higher as well. They yeah. really need to redo and re rework things. And They're using this new, like, uh, photorealistic scanning uh, technology from what I've read about for the Elder Scrolls 6, which looks kind of neat. I don't know. It's, this whole thing is weird that they even announced it at all this early is, is bizarre to me. I don't know that they're necessarily delivering these games late because the situation when they released Oblivion and even Skyrim, it's just different now for yeah. them. And they just came out with 76. Right. A few years after a few years, years after Fallout 4. So it's not like they haven't been doing anything, but. Right. So I think that it's just going to take some time. But I agree with you. I think that 10 years at least will separate Skyrim from Elder Scrolls 6. But I think it's going to make you want it that much more, if I might say so. Travis Kessler wrote into us and said, hey, Colin, an annual uploader, Chris. Uh, Chris just uploaded. <laughs> I a just video. uploaded. Take that. I have a question regarding game sales nowadays. I've noticed recently a trend with large game releases that within a month, within a month, I'm sorry, the game goes on sale. I distinctly remember purchasing Hitman 2 release day and a few weeks later finding out they were advertising a sale for it. I felt cheated out of my money when that happened, and I've been doing my best to avoid purchasing most games on release because of it. Do you guys have an explanation for why companies are so quick now to reduce the price of games? And should consumers be wary of this happening a lot more in the future? I feel like games being reduced in price very quickly after release will reduce initial release numbers. Love the podcast and look forward to many more years of Sacred Symbols. Thank you, Travis. So this is a little bit of a problem, and I totally understand why people don't want to buy games right away because prices do drop, and, and we've all been burned by it. Mm -hmm. I think the reason game prices drop quickly, Chris, is because, especially at retail, you know, our retail buyers at Amazon or Walmart or whatever, they make predictions based on pre-orders and algorithmic information about how many games they should buy. And if they buy too many copies of Fallout 76, they need to get rid of them. And the way to get rid of them is to cut the price. But I don't think it's always on the publisher. I think a lot of people are just overbuying. I think they have too much stock. I think it's too competitive. I think they're reading the tea leaves. They also have amazing, like I said, algorithmic information, mathematical information and data that they can comb through and really figure out what people are buying and what they're not. They have an interesting job and they're wrong sometimes and they have to eat shit. But what, how do you, I guess, then, because uh, what if a game on digital goes on sale? What then, though? Because that's not overbuying. No, that's not overbuying. But I will say from my experience that that doesn't happen as often. This was actually a complaint that ha what, what, two, one or two weeks ago, I think we talked about this on Sacred Symbols. We were saying that digital sales stay static for far longer and that, you know, Sony's trying to manipulate the market by removing game card sales, basically, from, yeah, from third party Amazon. retailers. 
So I don't know that you're really experiencing that problem to begin with on, on digital stores because they're not dropping the price of these games. It's really only happening in the retail environment. So I totally understand why people would wait. And if I was like just a casual, not casual, I don't know if I'd ever be a casual gamer, but if I was just a gamer that didn't do this for a living, I would be all about playing whatever and I would just wait for games to drop in price. I mean, yeah, I have no real urge to play games when they come out immediately with rare exception. Yeah, it's definitely a very small percentage of games. It's kind of part of the game, right? Like if you want to see, for it's a great example. If you want to go to a movie theater in the first two months and see a movie, you're going to pay a premium price for it. Oh, yeah. You can rent it a couple months later on VOD for $3.99. You know, yeah, no, exactly. So I think you just have to play the, you know, for lack of a better term, play the game. And part of the game is just not knowing. But I agree with Travis in the sense that this is causing a little bit of uncertainty where it might be delivering inaccurate data to purchasers and to retailers because people are like, well, you're just going to drop the prices. I mean, that happened to Fallout 76 when, yeah, when yeah. the rumor with Fallout 76 that it was going to go free to play, which didn't happen. But when that rumor happened, people fucking lost it. And I don't blame them. Yeah. And with game prices largely, I think, going up soon, as we've talked about many times, this is a thread that needs to be needle or needle that needs to be thread threaded uh, much more effectively. Michael T. Bailing wrote into us, said, hello, CNC. Rumors are going around saying that Microsoft is thinking about combining Xbox Live with Game Pass. Now, how would you feel about Sony combining PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now? How much would you all pay for this? First of all, this is a nece- this is necessary. Yeah. If, no, I, I agree. If Microsoft, I don't use, I don't use yeah. PlayStation now specifically because I don't feel like adding another thing. Right, exactly. If Microsoft does this, which they're going to, then Sony is completely not competitive anymore with PlayStation Plus if they keep things separate. Yeah. They've basically worked their way down to the value proposition of gold by giving two games a month, which is exactly what Xbox has been doing for a long time. They used to give 360 games away, but they don't do that anymore. They do. Oh, they do still give 360 games mm-hmm. away. Because a lot of things are backwards compatible now. Ah, uh, so, yes, of course. So they have, uh, they have like 360 games, and then they, I think they have two 360 games and two Xbox One games. Oh, I didn't know that. As far so, as I know. I could be wrong. I don't spend a lot of time looking at it, but I believe that it was that way the last time I saw well, it. Well, you're probably right. And assuming that's true, then the value proposition is already bad. Apples to a- apples, right? So if they do this, then they have to combine PlayStation now. And, and I agree with you. Like, I don't want to pay another subscription. If they, if they gave us View now and Plus. That'd be, that'd be great. So you have television, you have back catalog of games, and you have free games and discounts and online play and all that. I'd pay $100 a year for that. I'd pay even more for that, actually. The thing with View, I think, specifically, is that View is pretty expensive. I don't know that they're going to be able to really tie that in. What is View? It's just like a... It's For people that don't know, it's VUE, and it's network television. And and it's it's supposed to be pretty good. Like, I know some people that have it, and they're like, it's pretty good. You know, because you don't have everything, but if you want to just have some news channels and you want to have some network channels and you want to have a fucking animal planet and stuff, you can do (laughs) all that. That's cool. Yeah. So I think, uh, Michael, I think Chris and I are probably in agreement that Sony has to combine these services. Yeah. The more value you give, the better. I mean, I remember when Xbox Game Pass came out, I was like, this should just be on Xbox Live Gold. I don't know why this isn't on Xbox Live Gold. Well, it's just another way for them to extract, what is it, $4.99 a month or something like that? Yeah, it's true. It works because it's it's a good value. It's a great value. I mean, that's the thing. That's the thing. Microsoft has these certain features and functionalities that like the Elite Controller, I know that there's that third-party Elite Controller. I don't care. I want a Sony Elite Controller. I don't buy third-party controllers. Don't third buy third-party controllers. controllers. No, I, well, <laughs> Sony endorses a third-party Elite Controller. But matter. I think that that's so weird. It's like, why just don't make you just own. make your own? Just make your own. What the fuck are you guys just, doing? I hate... Uh, even as, as strapped for cash as I've ever been, you know, I would skimp on toilet paper before I skipped on, skimped on controllers. I haven't bought a third-party controller in 25 years probably. i had a wireless logitech controller for the xbox the original and it had this plug that would that funneled out into this weird half mouse thing it was the worst thing i've ever bought yeah just, st- just i st- saved up for it back then as a kid i would idiot. just stick with the officially endorsed things but the point i was making is that microsoft has the elite controller they have backwards compatibility they have game pass like I'm really becoming quite envious it's of a very what's f- going on over there. It's, you know? a very fe- it's a very feature-rich r- uh, platform. It's just not f- rich in exclusive content. It is rich in fucking dorks. Paul Messman <laughs> has the final question, comment, concern. Dor- dor- rich <laughs> in dorks. <laughs> Paul Messman wrote into us, Chris. He says, howdy, Colin and Chris. I'd like to take a moment to complain about PS4 Pro's lack of 4K video support. Everyone seems to know it can't play 4K Blu-rays, but did you know that you cannot rent or buy 4K movies from Vudu or Amazon on PS4 Pro while Xbox One X can? I didn't know that, actually. Sony doesn't even sell 4K movies on the PlayStation Store. 
The only option for 4K video content seems to be Netflix and YouTube. This is better than nothing, but not ideal if you're looking for something specific. For a console marketed as a 4K media device, how is this acceptable? It is super, that, that confused me when it first came out, that like the PS4 Pro wouldn't play 4K Blu-rays, and I was like, that's that's a little, that's a little weird, that's usually what they do. If it's a 4K machine, it should play 4K things. Right. It's, it, I, I always thought that was weird. It didn't really matter to me that much. I have a few 4K Blu-rays, maybe like three. I don't really buy physical media anymore anyway. But I do think it's weird that the 4K PlayStation doesn't play 4K video at all. I didn't know that. Is that true, actually? Yeah, well, I know that I knew that it natively doesn't, right? Like it doesn't play 4K. I knew that it didn't play 4K games. He's not saying it doesn't play it natively. What he's saying is that you can't access 4K t stuff on some of these services that are available on PlayStation right. Network, while PlayStation 4 Pro should theoretically be able to play their content. But Xbox One X does allow for yeah. access to the Voodoo store to download 4K content. It is an interesting point. It's a very nuanced point, but it's a very interesting point. And that would frustrate the shit out of me, too. The thing I think might be there might be two reasons about this, and I'm speaking from complete fucking ignorance here. So forgive me. The first reason might be that maybe the PS4 Pro simply can't render some of these like doesn't interact with these services in order to play 4K technology. PS4 Pro does seem very half baked. The second more important thing is that Sony might be like, this is incredible bandwidth required to stream 4K download off of our servers. We would have no interest in giving you access to that right now. Because you have to imagine Netflix does allow 4K streaming, so that might have something to do with it. I don't know. I mean, it, that's probably my assumption. My, my assumption, I think you were right to say that the, the machine is probably just not built in a way that's capable of doing it. I think even when PS4 Pro came out and it was like, oh, hey, it won't run native 4K, it'll it'll kind of upscale. And I was like, why not just wait a year? Yeah, PS4 wait, Pro wait. just seemed like, it, 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 I mean, listen, we've been over this before. I was wrong about it. I was really wrong about how well it's it would better, do. It's better than the base PS4. And yeah, I, think I, I think it's worth having, but yeah. it's also one of these things that's like, it's weird when you look at it in comparison to the Xbox One X, which is actu actually runs things at proper 4K. It's, it's, it's a little weird that they didn't just wait an extra year and give the base PS4 a little bit more room to breathe. But then, I, I don't know. It, it's We're speaking out of ignorance here because we don't know what's what's going on behind the scenes or like what, even what the problem is inherently right. with the system or with the, the service that <laughs> doesn't let you do it. But it did seem pretty half-baked when it first came out. That was what my first indication that things were like a little bit weird with Sony. Well, it's not, my, it's not necessarily the solve that's going to heal this person's wound, but it is fair to say, similar to the backwards compatibility argument that we have, this will be solved on the next console. It's already solved on the current generation competition. So right. it's, it'll, it will absolutely be fixed by the next gen. But it is true to say, because we always want to keep it honest on this console or on this uh, podcast about it, the console that we talk about, regardless of the fact that we all love it, is that it's becoming more and more difficult. And well, I don't defend PlayStation at all about anything really anyway, but it's becoming more difficult to tell people, hey, PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pro are giving you the best possible console experience in a broad way. Right. right. They're the best games. There's uh, no fucking doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, 100%. And that's what matters to most people. But Xbox One X, it's like their access, their their services. It, the Sony has a lot of work to do, just a lot of work to do. I assume it's being done as we speak in earnest. You know, it's hard, it's becoming harder for me to be like, yeah, this is a great ecosystem. It's like their competition is really revving it up. Man, my assumption in a big way. My assumption has to be that they're gearing this kind of stuff up for the next generation. So that way they can launch with all these features that probably should have been on the previous generation and then be applauded for it. That's my assumption. Because if you let's say you have, uh, you know, backwards compatibility, you have 4K streaming on the PS4 Pro and the PS suddenly the PS5 comes out. There's far less features to gloat about. And I think I think it is probably a, a marketing decision, honestly, like let's hold off on the stuff so that we can have it advertised as a as a new feature. Right. I think you're probably right. But I will also say that it's dangerous to do that because yeah, it no, reminds it me a lot of like, I don't know that people are going to make the ne these necessary comparisons, but with Switch, for instance, it's like we have an app for voice, uh, you know, for voice chat. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder if it's going to come off like in a similar way where it's like we have 4K streaming. And it's like, OK, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's that's one of the things that we might, right. have, you know, I'm sure they're considering all of these uh, these options. Chris, that's all I have. Yeah. For this week's Sacred Symbols, episode 41. It's fairly, it was, fairly content rich, rich yeah, in dorks. A, it was rich in dorks. Well, not as rich in dorks as the Xbox <laughs> ecosystem, but rich in dorks nonetheless and nerds. Uh, Chris, appreciate you as always. Appreciate everyone out there listening to our show. Remember, if you have a few dollars to spare and you like what we do, please consider supporting us on patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand to get early ad free access, the ability to interact with us with us on the show. By the way, the perks carry over to all my other podcasts and shows as well. So you guys can enjoy that. And uh, I want to just encourage you again. If you don't have the money to spare, don't feel like you have to do that. But if you have some disposable income and you like what we do, please consider supporting us. Yeah. You can also support us on free feeds. 
Leave us nice reviews. Yeah. And I should note that every time that I've mentioned something, typically Crash Team Racing, Grappling Hooks, it's happened. So you, do you donate a dollar and you bring up uh, Mega Man Battle Network, maybe I'll think about Mega Man Battle Network yeah. real hard, and then Chris, it'll happen. Chris just sits in his room at, in, at night. With Meditating. Like a, yeah, med there's like staring at a photo. Right, a photo or a word. It's like, like that. that clip of Wolverine from the X Men animated series with the picture of like whoever. <laughs> <laughs> Chris will make your dreams come true. Yes. So we will see you next week for more Sacred Symbols. Remember, for those of you that do support us on Patreon, uh, appreciate your patience. The episode will go up one day later than usual, but free feeds will not be affected. I have nothing left to say to you, so it's time for me to go. Alrighty. I wish you all the best. Thank you for your support. See you next time. Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is fan supported over at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon, and I want to thank you from the very bottom of my heart for your incredible kindness and generosity. Carlos Algarit, Eric Alley, CJ Anderson, George Anthony Nunez, Morgan Ashley, Sean Battershaw, Martin Beck, Michael Betts, Eric Bishop, Mark Boggio, Eli Bosford, Barrett Boswell, Spencer Brand, Miguel Brewer, Lennon Brixey, Matthew Brousseau, Josh Bushing, Austin Bullock, Andrew Burkhart, Dylan Burns, Chris Buston, Alex Cabrera, Brian Cacciatolo, Will Caldwell, Patrick Harper, William O'Carroll, Ryan Caulfield, Brian Chan, Travis Chandler, Sean Chandler, David Chestnut, Simon Conception Jr., Brad Cooley, Gio Corsi, Cutter Crow, Nick Cummings, Daniel Diamor, Colin Davenport, Daniel Delanicos, Mitchell Dur Cash, Night Draft, David Ellis, Martha Emery, Joe Finelli, Eric Finkenbeiner, Candler Four, Fotios Frangos, Michael Gallier, Chris Galvin, Connor Gassian, Alex Gates, Michael Gates, Salem Gotham Algonum, Toothless Gibbon, Daniel Glassford, Tyler Goodwin, Josh Gravelick, Miranda Grubba, Tyler Harris, Kyle Hagel, Wyatt Henry, Asa Haas, Azan Isa El Ricey, Josh Yeager, John Jameson, Joshua Jonathan, Greg Julefs, N. K., Jeremy Key, James Kinslow the Third, Ryan R. Kittredge, Jackson Lastiqua, Donald Laws, Joe Lawson, Don Q. Lee, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith Adrian Lewis, Chad. Chad Lewis, Lou and Ray Loper, Elijah Lopez, Colin Love, Josh M, Ryan T. Mandel, Peter Mark, Michael Martinez, Sean Mason, Zachariah McAdoo, John McCarthy, Joe McPartland, Dennis Meinchin, Andrew Mendoza, Christopher Midling, Albert Miranda, Patrick Malloy, Betty Ann Moriarty, Abe Mukhtar, Ryan Murdoch, Brian Nietzsche, Adam Nix, Donnie Nolan, Brian Ott, Jorge Palomino, Todd Paxton, Brendan Peavy, Marius S. Peterson, Enrique Perez, Nicholas Perfect, James Perone, Eric A. Peterson, Jason Pettit, Jeff Pollard, Louis Powell, Lawrence F. Prokop, Ryan Reeves, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Shane Rayum, Jonathan Rice, Mark Richardson, Toby D. Riemenschneider, Petro Rose, A.G. Rowe, John Scholes, Chris Schaefer, Michael Shanholtz, Brandon Sharkey, Toby Schutman, Glennon Cole Simper, Joshua Smallwood, Andrew Smith, Daniel Strycharsk, John Tamanillo, Ahmad Tamar, Joseph Thayer, Ben Thompson, Carl Tolman, Tam Tran, Alan Tremblay, Raymond Joshua Vargas, Michael Vecchio, Oakley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Isaac Wastman, Damon Weathers, Mike Wayant, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zaniga, Hugo's Desk, Casual Misfits Gaming, Supershot ST, Throw 7, Infinite, Homeworld Hub, Mad Mock Media, Fabian, Mubarak, Richter86, That Rescue Guy, Andrew, Ian, Chris, Donk2015, and Gavin.